The product reviewed in this video was supplied to me at no charge by the manufacturer. I accepted it under the strict understanding that this would be my honest opinion, including any flaws. The supplier had absolutely no editorial oversight of the video. This is the OC GoStream Deck, a 4 input, arguably 5 but we'll come to that, HDMI switcher and stream encoder. It takes HD signals from things like camcorders and enables you to switch between them while it feeds the resulting program up to services like Twitch or YouTube and the like. This is what you get in the box. The device itself, a multi-country power supply and a little getting started booklet. Frustratingly, the power supply wasn't multi-country enough to include a UK 3-pin adapter, just 2-pin ones which don't fit here. Underneath the unit is blank except for rubber strips along either side to raise it slightly off a desk. The front is likewise minimal, barring an SD card socket and a card was supplied, although I don't know if that was just the manufacturer being kind to me. At either end there are vents for passive cooling. The back has all the inputs and outputs, starting with 3.5mm headphone and mic jacks. Then the four full-size HDMI inputs, to which your sources must be set to 1920x1080 HD. There are two HDMI outputs, typically used for program and multi-view. One USB is for sending output to a laptop, the other is an input for a webcam, hence me saying this is a five-source switcher. There's Ethernet for the streaming connection, there's no Wi-Fi, and there's the locking 12V DC input. On top you have the usual array of switching and configuration buttons. Starting top left there's the power knob, a button to start and stop live streaming, and the audio controls. Next up are six macro buttons which can be programmed to record any series of keystrokes for immediate recall. You've got buttons to record the stream as you go, plus playback for video files off the SD card. Underneath those are two keyers. Then you have the transition controls which determine how it looks when you cut between cameras, and there's a traditional TV style T-bar also for transitions. Finally along the bottom are the four main camera source selectors, plus the duplicate set which give you your preview before a transition. Let's see it in action. It is very straightforward, like all of these, you've got an on-off button top left, just tap it to turn the thing on and press and hold to turn the thing off. That is good because it means you can't accidentally turn it off by just brushing against it. If I just quickly tap it, it doesn't turn it off, I'd have to press and hold it, that is good. You've got a live streaming button here, this is not just a switcher, it does encode the video as well and will send it up to not one, not two, but three streaming destinations simultaneously, provided of course that you have sufficient upstream internet bandwidth, but if you've got a good internet connection it will fire it out to YouTube and Twitch and Facebook or something like that, you just have to give it the appropriate stream keys and destinations and you do that with an SD card which I will show you in a minute. Over here on the left you've got the traditional two rows of buttons, the program row, as you switch between them the program output directly switches to whichever of those inputs you are switching to, camera 1, camera 2, camera 3, camera 4. If you like you can however look at camera 1, camera 2, camera 3, camera 4 on the preview bus and you can also set up different shots like um, super source and picture in picture and things on the preview bus and then switch to them and the way you switch to them is using either the cut button here, which will switch directly between whatever is currently on the program and whatever is currently on the preview, or you can use the auto button, which will choose whichever of the transition types you've selected here, a mix or a wipe or a dip to colour. And if you want to look at what those transitions would look like without actually doing them, if you press preview and then auto, it will give you on the preview monitor a preview of what your transition will look like. So that's a mix. If we had dip, then dip to colour would look like that. And that's not going live, that's all just showing you on the preview how it would look. Take preview off, and then when you do an auto cut, it will actually do that cut for real. And then you've also got a fade to black, which unsurprisingly fades everything to black. And when you fade to black, it mutes the audio as well as the video. 
Over here, you've got some audio controls, mic one and mic two for the 3.5 millimeter inputs on the side. And the way this works is you select an input and then you can decide whether to turn it on or off. It's as simple as that for the mic inputs. They're either on or off. But with the four HDMI inputs, the camera inputs, one, two, three, and four, you can either set them to be permanently on or you can set them to be audio follows video. In other words, the audio from that camera will only be on when you've actually switched to it. So at the moment, I've got camera four live. The audio from camera one, because it's AFV, would not be going to air. But if I switch to camera one, then the audio from camera one would now be going to air. And if I went to two, camera one audio would be switched off again. But you can, if you like, set a camera's input to be permanently on. So, for example, supposing you were doing your audio mixing through a separate mixing board and you fed it into one of the cameras, you'd probably want that camera's audio then permanently on even as you were switching away the video of the cameras. I hope that makes some sort of sense. There is a very useful AUX input on this mixer. It's really quite a powerful mixer. You can configure so many things on this. It is probably the most configurable HDMI switcher I've seen. But one very useful benefit, it has this AUX input, which can be configured either to take a USB webcam as an input from a socket on the back, so it effectively gives you a fifth camera source, or it can take an NDI camera input from the local area network, again, fifth camera source, or it can read video files from the SD card stuck in here, which again gives you an additional source. Now, at the moment, uh, I have set it up to be playing video files off the um, card. And again, we'll go through the configuration of that all through the menus, which is done through this button here. But again, with AUX, you can turn its, its video on or off, or you can make it audio follow video so that it's only playing the sound from whatever that source is when you've actually switched to it. And I should point out that while you've got big buttons, one, two, three, four, for the main um, switching, you have also got little extra buttons here for switching to AUX. So if you wanted to go to your SD card, directly to air, you could push that button and it will start playing that um, video file that I had. You can also then stop it with the transport buttons here. Play, stop, rewind and go forward. Now they're a bit funny in that um, you can't change it while it's gone to air. That's to stop you accidentally changing a video while it's playing. Um, but if you want to switch between them, let's say we bring AUX off air and put a camera to air, so we can play that under the preview and stop it and change which file it's going to play. There we go, that's the next one on the disc. And now if I were to take that to air, it would take and play that one to air. You've also, by the way, got here some a record and recording stop button. So that same SD card that has images and, and videos you want to play out to, if you press the top button there, rec, you'll notice a little record light has come up on the um, screen, on the multi-view, and it's now recording whatever output you've set to be the recorded output, which in this case I think I've set to be the multi-view, actually. But you could normally have the program output, and it would store it on the card, and you can stop it recording uh, by pressing that stop button. This knob here is also used in the audio setting. If I go back to, let's say, input one, that's camera one, it's on. And then as you turn this, it's actually adjusting the gain of input one. Plus, you can go all the way down to minus 75, and you can go all the way up to plus 10 to make it as loud as you want it to be. These buttons, memory one to memory eight, are little macro buttons, and it's both a clever and infuriating system. The way this works is, and they've predefined five macros, four do something useful and five turns them off. Uh, and then you can redefine them as you want. But what you do is you press and hold one of these buttons and then it will start recording any keystrokes you make. So you, I don't know if there's a limit on how many keystrokes it will record, but effectively you could press and hold that, go into the menu, set up things the way you want them, and when you've done it, press and hold the button again, and it will have recorded all the keystrokes you made, including all the settings you made. And then when you press that button, just press it rather than press and long press it, it reenacts those keystrokes. The trick with it is that if you don't set a menu item, but that menu item was important to whatever you were trying to record, it won't have recorded it because it 
if you didn't set it, it didn't record a keystroke with it. So you've got to go into everything in the menu that you think you might later change but would want back for whatever it is you're configuring and click on it even if you're not actually changing the value, if you see what I mean. You've just got to remember it literally records keystrokes. So if you want it to have things set exactly as they are, sometimes you've got to record things even though you're not changing the value that it is currently set to. Um, I'll, perhaps I'll give you an example. That is a bit confusing. Uh, the menu button here, you press this to get into the menus and you scroll through with this button and then you click that button down to select something, scroll down, click it again, click into it and then you can change things and then you press menu to get back out. A little bit fiddly but you get the hang of it and as I said there are a lot of options in these menus. You really can go through a heck of a lot of stuff. Um, I suppose the final thing just to mention here is that it has got the traditional T-bar for switching. So if I had, uh, let's say, camera one and camera two, and I wanted to flip between them using the T-bar, there we go, the program output gently changing. Back background, but good, doesn't seem to do anything. I've not worked out what that one does at all. However, these are to do with keying. You've got two keyers, one which can be set up as a chroma key or a picture-in-picture -picture or a luma key, and then there's a downstream keyer which you would typically put a logo on and then it would overlay it onto the output. You can preview them by pressing key, and I don't think they're set to anything at the moment, and you can put them to air by pressing the button above on air, or you could preview them um, using the key and downstream keyer button, and then when you took the preview to air, it would put them to air if they actually had any keys defined, which they don't. But if they did, they would pop up like a logo or a picture in picture. You've also got a super source in this, which is two of the inputs, and it can be, I think, any of the four camera inputs or the auxiliary, or even a still, um, side by side on screen over a background. And again, the configurability is quite extensive because you can set how big you want those side by side, where you want them on screen. And weirdly, Super Source is referred to as black. I've pointed out to the manufacturer that black is a meaningless, if you're going to call it Super Source in the menus, but Super Source is what the black button does. In fact, I'll just take black to wear and see if it actually does anything. No, it's not configured, so it's just going to send it to quite literally black, but if you had the input set up, and I'll show you how to do that in a second, um, it would have just put that to air. Right, let's stop mucking about and show you the menus. So first of all, you've got this coloured background you can set. There's two possible colour backgrounds which come into play in the other settings. So you can click to select it, select your hue, let's have a bit of that, select your saturation, bit of that, and you can see that it shows you the current, current colour and what you're doing, and then you can turn down the brightness turn up the brightness, change the hue, and that sets you colour one, and you can do the same for colour two, which by default is this sort of orangey yellow, and those come into play later on. Talking of super source, here is the super source. You can enable it by turning it on here. I don't know why you ever wouldn't enable it, really, because it doesn't go to air by you pressing enable, that just enables it in the software. It would only ever go to air if you actually pressed the um, black button there. But let's let's turn it on. And then your source, you've got two sources in Super Source. In fact, I tell you what, let's put it to preview. There we go. So source one at the moment is HDMI input one, but I could make that two, three, four, or the auxiliary. Let's have input one. Input two, again, you can make it any of the four inputs or the auxiliary or the stills or I think a co yeah, colour one that we just set, colour two that we just set, or colour bars or black. Well, let's have it as, uh, I don't know, input three or something. And then the background, still number one. Well, we haven't actually loaded any stills yet off the card, so I tell you what, let's back out of Super Source. Let's go down to stills and load up some stills. Under still generator, You've got the selection of stills. It's got a library in it of, I think it's something like 32, so numbers 0 to 31. And you can have two active at any time, which you can see on the multi-view screen, still one and still two. So let's upload some stills. So into location 0, I think I will load this logo. Now these are just stored on the SD card in a directory called images. So anything with a PNG you pop in there should come up here and you can flick through them all. So there's 
trees in Palmer, there's a fountain in Palmer, a bit of art. I'm going to load up the logo into number one because that will um, come in useful later on when I show you the Kia. Into number two, let's have a nice narrowboat scene. There we go. And it has correctly loaded those into still one and still two, which you can see on the preview um, screen. Let's go back up to super source and finish setting that up. So under source, we can now change the background to still one or in fact, let's have still two. So there we go. You can see that the background to my super source has become still number two. But there's more to it than that because you can change how it puts these screens side by side. The default is zoom in, but as you toggle through, you see crop zoom in is one is cropped and the other is zoomed. Then you can have them the other way around. Then you can have them both full screen, but cropped. Um, and you can also actually, if we just change that to be the zoom in crop, you can change where on the screen you want that by twiddling the knob. And there we go. Let's have a bit of that. But that's not all, because then you can turn on some masks onto it. I'm not going to go through literally every one of these, but you can turn on some masks onto these. You see, I'm masking out that left hand one there and we'll turn out a bit of um, bit of mask there. So you could have it like that and you could you could turn that on. So if you really want to, you can muck around with all of these. And again, going back to the macros, anything you press that is a key press, the macro will record. But if, for example, you came here and you set this to 90%, but you also wanted each end to be 100%, you'd need to go in and just double click it to make sure that whenever you go into that macro in the future, it remembers to also set each end to 100% just in case it isn't, because you've changed it some other time. Mask 2 is for the um, other side, of course, so we can mask that one a bit more, showing the underlying picture. You get the general gist, but you can also then have borders, and you can set the border, there we go, and again, you can set the hue, let's change that to a nice, whatever that colour is, and the saturation. It's really, really configurable, and now, um, if I were to take that to where, there you go, I've got a lovely two cameras side by side um, all looking rather lovely and I'm not sure whether let's just see if we can do this can we actually yeah we can actually make the background of th uh, one of the HDMI inputs as well look at that so it really is very very flexible I think I'll put that back to being an image there and that is your super source otherwise known as black weirdly on the keyboard. Now, uh, keys. This one is called key and the key can be, it all gets a tad confusing this, but it can be a luma key, it can be a chroma key, or it can be a pattern which you can set, or it can be a picture in picture. Let's pop it onto a chroma key just because I've set one of the cameras up specifically for this and then we go back out and we go back into the chroma key settings and we set the source for the chroma key to be, it'll be camera four, where's camera four gone? Uh, there's camera four and let's preview that so we can see what we're doing. Um, so there's camera four, which is the shot of the Ghost Dreams box with a green screen on it and you can see it's already actually doing the keying you can mask the key if you want to, so you can um, you can just see that I'm cropping out a bit of the image with the mask there. So if you had a bad key or if you only had a small green screen, you can actually key out by using the mask to a certain degree. There we go. So that would be to there and then the end would be to there. Now I'll tell you now, my green screen is not ironed and it's lit by one light. It is not the best green screen in the world, but you are getting the general gist of the keying. And then you can also resize your key. So you can have it 0 0.33, 0 0.5, or I think 0.25. Let's have it at 0.5. And then you can move it around on screen. Where do you want that? Oh, I'll have it up there. Thanks very much. So you could use that for all sorts of things. That could be me, I suppose, against a background. And the backdrop could be a game. If you're if you're a game streamer, um, you'd have it the other way around, wouldn't you? Instead of me chatting away, and the box, you'd have me in the in the picture-in-picture -picture 
key um, with the game in the background. Now, in terms of the keying itself, you can change the color. So if I put this onto enable, we're literally looking at that source. You can see that the current color is that sort of green and you can pick with a little thing on screen where it's actually sampling the color from. So if I pick that, that's now the color and then you can adjust. I'll turn the sampling off, gives us the key again. Having done that, you can now adjust the keying parameters a bit, which will either make it a noisier image or a better key. There is always with these things a degree of fiddling around to do. See, if I turn that down, it turns into quite a grainy image. And if I turn it up, we get a better key, but you run the risk of keying out too much of the box. I can see the side is just beginning to go a little bit there. So let's just turn that down a bit. Uh, we're bringing in a bit too much key. This is not doing a brilliant key because, as I say, my key is not lit terribly well. But you get the general gist and you can also adjust the softness of the image. So we turn that down. That's the sort of blending of the two. And you just have to fiddle with those until you get a nice, a nice key. Don't be confused by this calling a key pattern. This is actually not chroma key or luma key. It's if you change the key type from chroma to pattern, you can have a pattern which you set here, which is any one of your sources. So let's make it, I don't know, input three. And then you can set that to a, a pattern. And then as you bring this in, you see I've chosen a diamond pattern. And now there it is. Let's change that to the next one along, which is the circular pattern. And again, I can make that bigger or smaller. Let's have it there. And I can change where I want it on screen. Like that. And you can actually make it more circular or more oval or what it, it just it really is fantastically configurable, this thing. I I spent ages just playing with the different um, settings. And again, you can mask that out if you want to crop a bit of it to the left. You can do that. So you can have a whatever that is, a crescent, semicircle. No, half a semicircle. Whatever that is, you get the gist. Um, you can spend hours playing with this and you can resize it again. So if you want to make it smaller, bigger, whatever. Um, now, notice that as I do that, it is flashing. But we're doing it in the preview window, so that's OK. You want to do all these settings while you're previewing them, not while they're going to air, just in case it will make a funny flashing. Luma key, by the way, is just the same as the chroma key, but with a luma key instead of a chroma key. Um, what else? What other types of key can you have? There was pattern, picture. Oh, picture in picture. Yes. So if we'd set it to picture in picture instead of a chroma key, and again, we now go down to dedicated picture in picture settings. Again, we can set what the source is. You can just about see that I, the picture in picture is coming out in the bottom right of the preview. So I'm going to move that. Let's move that up so we can see what we're doing. There we go. So we can again select the source, input one, two, three, four, or the auxiliary, or still one, or still two, or color one, color two, or color bar, or black, whatever you want. Uh, let's have input three. And again, you can set the size and position as I just did. You can mask it, you can give it a little border. There we go, nice red border. And the color for the border is also set there. And again, you can change the hue. I think you get the general gist of this. It's really configurable. And that is the key. And then if I wanted to take it to air, Bosch, there it is, putting it over whatever we're currently sending to air. And you can do useful picture in picture with that. As well as don't forget, you've also got your super source. So you can actually have super source with a key over the top of it. If you really wanted to, you can configure this to be four inputs running simultaneously. Use the two super sources, then you define the key here to be picture in picture, but then you've also got this downstream key here, and if instead of using it for a logo, use it for another one of the inputs, you can have four inputs on screen at the same time. It's quite mind-boggling. Um, right, that was... Yeah, hang on, just gone out the menus. That was the keys, the picture in picture. Transition is the settings for these transitions. So your mix rate, that is how long you want the mix to last. If I set it to six and a half and then do a uh, 
an auto transition, it'll do a very, 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 very slow seven second transition, which you can see happening now on the program bus. And if I press it again, a very, 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 very slow transition. Can't imagine why you'd actually want it that long. I'm going to put it back to um, a second. Equally, you can do things like change what colour you want the dip to colour to go to. At the moment, it's set to colour one, but you can set it to colour two, colour bars, or you can actually set it to dip to one of the stills. So if I did that and do that, it will dip to the image and then bring the sources up. So again, very configurable. Pretty much any input can be used for anything, um, which is nice to see because sometimes these devices seem to have quite arbitrary um, limits on them. And this one, it just says, well, it's all done in software, so we'll let you use anything for anything. And then finally, wipes, of course. Normally, you might um, just let's let's pick a nice wipe. Let's have a uh, let's have a triangular wipe. And then you can set the rate and where you want it to happen and the symmetry and the so look at all this stuff you can set on the wipe. And then when you do the wipe, you can see I'm bringing up that triangular one there. In fact, you know, what? I'm going to I'm going to give it a border. There we go. Give it a nice, lovely green border. Oh, look at that. Who wouldn't want to have a transition like that on their output? So everything here can be configured. It's wonderful. Then here we have the downstream keyer, which is like the earlier keyer, except this is the downstream keyer. Again, you can choose what source you want. I think you're getting the gist of this now. I'll um, put that to preview. So there's what I want to do a downstream key on. Let's make it, for example, still one, which is my logo. And the confusing, you've got two settings here, fill, which is the actual image, and then key, which is the shape of the image. In, or, in order to enable it to key out. Still one key, there we go, get that right. And then when I take that to air, you've got the logo now over the top of whatever else I do. And as we change it, the logo stays up. Or well, you can, if you want to, turn it off. Weirdly, by turning the button on, turns it off on the preview, so that when you then cut, it's not on the... Um, on screen anymore. It's a bit weird. It sort of turns into an on off button the other way round when you've taken it to air. And that is the downstream key. You can also change your fade to black, how fast it fades to black and whether it will um, turn off the audio or not. Now in audio mixer, this is pretty much the same controls as you had on these buttons, but with a few extra bits as well. So you can, for example, set the volume of each channel. You can set here by turning the dial. You can also set the balance, so it's a stereo channel, so you can set it to go one way or the other. And you've got not only fader gain, but you've also got input gain on the channels as well. And you can also turn the channels off on or audio follows video, exactly as you could with the buttons. So let's go out of that. And you can set this for the mics, for the four HDMI inputs, for the auxiliary input, and as well, you can set a global output value for the program output, which is nice, as well as another level for the monitor output. Still generator, we've already looked at, you can pick two stills. Well, in fact, you can pick 32 stills, but you can have two active at any time, and you can upload them from your um, SD card. Macros, here you can save them, you can import and export them, which is um, quite a good idea. Stream is the three sources or destinations, I suppose, that you can stream to. So it's set up by default, this Africa TV, but you've got all these others. Uh, if we scroll through Twitch, Vimeo, there's YouTube, and you tell it you want the primary server. Now I've got, all it takes is a little text file under a, a folder on the SD card called streams or something and you just put your keys in there and then you can select them. If I had multiple keys I could toggle between them there and pick the right one for the right service. So if I had a key for Vimeo I'd pick out my Vimeo key on the Vimeo channel and it will stream as I say um, to all three of these at the same time if you want. Now if you want to give it less work to do you can turn the individual streams off. So you see stream two and three are set to off and stream one is on. But if you have the bandwidth, you can do it. 
Playback refers to playing back files off the SD card. You can either have them play once, you can have them repeat, or you can just have it play them all one after the other. I think it's more likely you'd have them as it to play once and then you can choose what you want to do. And then finally, when we get into the settings, if we don't have enough settings, you've got the version of the software. You can change how you want the things to show up on the multi view. So at the moment, program is called program and preview is preview. But if you want to, for example, aux, now it's it's set to UVC at the moment, but I've actually got it set to being the SD card for an input. So I'm, I can change this. I can uh, I always delete. It's a little bit painful doing it with the scroll wheel, but you can. So I might have this set to let's have caps lock and then a get rid of caps lock. A U X and hit OK. And now you'll notice on the multi view, my um, f fifth input has been relabeled aux, which is rather nice. Again, customization, call the things what you want. You can turn on the different meters. At the moment, there's no audio meter on the program feed, but you can um, turn that on if you want. I certainly would have that on by default. And you can have the individual. Um, audio meters on the individual inputs, which again, I would normally have on by default, but if you want them off, you can turn them off. And then here we go. I did mention at the start, you can swap these around. Instead of bringing program preview, you can have it as uh, that way around, which I much prefer. Preview on the left, program on the right. I like that. This is labeled market. It's actually markers. It's a typo in the menus. I've told them about it, but if you want to, you can turn guidelines on so um, they, obviously they don't go out to air like that they don't even give the option of putting them to air obviously you wouldn't want your markers going out live but you can have them on the preview screen so you can see when you're lining cameras up whether things are going to be um, visible um, given cut off areas and things like that you can also change your microphone inputs from line to um, microphone levels or mic plus power which is nice you've got a little unpowered 3.5 millimeter mic you can um, tell the device to send it a bit of power which is again nice little feature to have the record file when you press this recording button you can give it a name a little bit painful again to do it with the scroll wheel but you can otherwise it gives it some weird random default name uh, source selection is actually to do with uh, what's coming into the different sources. So input one is, a, is an HDMI input and you can tell it what color space it's coming in, RGB full color or RGB limited, which be your standard TV um, settings and all these other nerdy things. Honestly, probably best left on auto. And then down the bottom is where you change the fifth auxiliary input from being either the SD card to a USB camera or an NDI. Now I would assume Conceivably, if you connected a laptop over the USB and could output from the laptop as if it were a USB camera, you could use that to do overlays and things potentially. I haven't tried that. I'm just wondering whether you could or you could do presentation slides and things coming off a laptop by putting them in that or, or by sending it over NDI. Anyway, it's jolly flexible having that, I think. And the output format, again, you can change all this. I'm not going to change this because it reboots the um, mixer when you do it, but you can set 10 out, 1080p, 25, 30, 50, 60. And again, you can change the output color space. Oops, oh, I'm going to cancel on that. Cancel. Uh, you can change the output color space to whatever you want to set it to. Again, best if you do um, auto. Because it has two HDMI outs, that's why you've got output one and output two. Uh, hang on, let's get out of that. And then the output source, here's the two HDMI outputs. You can you can set these how you want. HDMI 1 can be program, it could be preview, it could be multi-view, it could be any of the individual inputs. Normally you'd have that perhaps to be program. HDMI 2 would be plugged into a monitor as multi-view. And at the moment I've got the webcam out being the multi-view so that I can record the multi-view while I'm talking to you. But typically you might have that set to program out. I'm not going to do it. Um, so that you could, if you wanted to stream from a laptop instead of from this device, you'd set the UVC out to be program out and then you'd go into something like OBS. Uh, but at the moment it's multi-view because I'm recording it that way. Um, quality is the quality of both your recording and streaming. Now I tried this before in an earlier version of the software and the streaming bit rates were really very low. I've told them about that. They may be changing it in a future update, I'm not sure. Uh, but it works. I can confirm the streaming works. Network, I've got a network cable plugged in here. 
and it just picks up with DHCP and gives you a, a DNS, as you can see, so that's all fine. I love this feature. The buttons on the unit, you can tell it how bright you want them, because by default, they come on. Let me show you how bright they come on by default. They come on that bright. Now, if you're working outside with this, I'm sure that brightness is very handy, but in a darkened room, that is blinding. So put them back down to zero, and it's a, just a much more gentle glow on the buttons. Little things like this, you see, the very fact that they've given you the ability to change the brightness of the buttons. It's good. I like that. Different languages, and then you can reset the device, or you can um, format the card. And that, I think, pretty much is everything. Okie dokie then, how about some conclusions about this? Well, first and foremost, I like it. It is compact, lightweight, easy to carry around, easy to take with you if you are going somewhere to do a live stream or whatever. I was less impressed by the fact that it didn't come with a UK power supply. It was just pure coincidence that I happened to have another one that fitted the socket on the back and provided the right amount of power. I did let the manufacturers know, so hopefully if they start selling in the UK, they'll include just the little adapter. That's all it needs. The power supply itself then has these clip-on adapters. It just needs one that goes into a UK three-pin socket. It does get very, very hot on the bottom here where the circuit boards is. As far as I can tell from peering into the ends, it's all passively cool. I can't see any signs of a fan in there. It just looks like circuit board. Uh, so what the effect would be over the long term of this thing getting very, very hot, I don't know. But again, one presumes the manufacturer has thought about that and have tested it and given it sufficient uh, just ventilation on the sides for it to cope with that. It is, as I think I mentioned about 20 times during the demo, very, very flexible. And I really like that. I've used some of these units where you just think, well, why can't I reconfigure the inputs or the outputs? But this one pretty much lets you say that any input can be used on anything. And that is very nice. I like the fact it's got the super source. And then on top of that, you can put the key. And on top of that, you can put the downstream key here. It's got the chroma keying. It's got the sound mixing facilities. It's very nice that it has the fifth auxiliary input, which either can be the, the card playback of video files or an extra camera source coming in over NDI or um, USB. Now, I didn't actually test those things because I don't have a webcam to plug in over USB and I don't have any NDI sources. But on the assumption that those all work fine, it's very useful to have that as a fifth input in what is ostensibly a four input HDMI mixer. It's going to retail, I'm told, at about $295, I think that's about £260. That certainly puts it in direct competition, of course, with the Black Manic Magic Manic Black Magic ATEM Mini Pro. Used to be that the ATEM Mini was about $300. They've changed all the prices fairly recently, I think. And the ATEM Mini Pro is now that sort of ballpark. And they're very similar in a sense. Four input HDMI switches, both of which do streaming encoding built in. And if you plug them into um, the internet, they will, they will then stream off to YouTube or wherever else you want to stream to. The pros for the Black Magic would be that it has built into it the Fairlight audio controls. So if you want to do any kind of compression or EQ or, or shaping of your audio, if you plug a laptop into the ATEM Mini, you can do that on all the channels and the main output. This doesn't have anything like that. It's got volume controls for each audio input and you can switch them on and off. And that's about it. So any kind of audio shaping, the Blackmagic has the win. However, the Achilles heel on the Blackmagic device, the ATEM Mini Pro, as far as I'm concerned, is that it only has one HDMI output. Now, for me, I'm going to want that to be my multi-view so I can see what I'm doing. But I will also want a second output, just a clean program output, either so that I can record it into an HDMI recorder or so that, for example, if I was doing a conference or something, I can have a, a, a feed from this to a screen showing whatever it is I'm switching. Well, the ATM Mini Pro just has the one. And if you put that to multi-view, then you've you've lost your main program out. You just don't have it. Or if you have your program out, you've lost your multi-view. So for me, that would be a fatal flaw on the smaller ATEM units. You have to go up to the ATEM extremes, I think, to get two HDMIs out. And they're, they're much more expensive. So for me, I would choose this for my circumstances over the ATEM Mini Pro. I really do like everything about it. The only thing that's slightly fiddly is 
the macros, the fact that it records literally keystrokes and you've got to think very carefully, do I need to make it record this value just by clicking it to say, yes, make this part of the macro and record it, as opposed to some other devices which make the macros a bit simpler. They just make them screen layouts and you set up a layout and say record that into button A and it just records that screen layout as button A. Simpler but less flexible. This is more flexible but a bit more complicated and you'd have to definitely test your macro in various circumstances to make sure you'd pressed and recorded all the buttons. Uh, but apart from that, um, I think that's about it. I like it. Oh, and the other thing I noticed, and I did mention this in the demo, the stream bit rates on this seem to be quite low. It has low, medium and high. And even when I told it to do high, I looked on YouTube at what YouTube said I was streaming to it at, and it was only about one megabit, which is not a lot. And especially considering that this doesn't have Wi-Fi connection, you'll be plugging in through the um, Ethernet, and that presumes you're going off to some router that probably has a decent connection, in which case one megabit is not a lot. I would certainly like to see a higher high value of, I don't know, five to eight megabits, would that be reasonable? Or even for you to just have a value that you can set it to yourself. On the last um, one of these switches I reviewed, um, I think it was the previous video on the channel, you could just turn a dial and go from one up to something about 30 megabits, I think. So it would be nice to have a much more variable setting for the actual stream bit rate. So if you want to do quality and you've got the upstream uh, connection, then you could do that. But at the moment, um, they were set a little low. Again, that's something I told the manufacturer. I said, look, make the low one really low, make the medium one one to two megabits and make the high bit rate eight or something like that. At least there's a proper differentiation between them. They seem to be quite responsive at listening to me on the emails and, and putting out new firmware updates. So perhaps that is something they will address in future. So that's about it. I like the device and uh, yes, can generally recommend it. Thanks for watching. Hope this was useful. Cheerio.